This is actually the inaugural uh, Heart Foundation um, presentation as part of the Samri Heart Health Program on a Friday morning. So it's lovely. Uh, thank you very much to Samri for allowing us to steal a portion of their program. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name's Imelda Lynch. I'm the current CEO of the Heart Foundation and warmly welcome you all uh, here this morning. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor David Dunstan to you all. Um, Professor is the, the um, leader of the, uh, or the laboratory head of the physical activity um, laboratory in, at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne. Uh, David is also a great friend of the Heart Foundation. He chairs our physical, the National Physical Activity Committee, um, which is a subgroup of the national board uh, providing information to the Heart Foundation about physical activity so that what we do is very much evidence-based. And uh, he is also a recipient of some Heart Foundation research grants and has also been a wonderful supporter of our Move More, Sit Less program. So uh, we're very happy to uh, have David's involvement throughout our organisation. The other thing that David does is a relentless researcher and a relentless publisher with over 200 publications around his research theme of physical activity, uh, sedentary behaviours and lifestyles which lead to chronic health conditions. So we're very, very pleased to have David here this morning. Very much look forward to your presentation. Um, some of the Heart Foundation staff went to the Ergo Centre yesterday and listened to David's presentations and they actually came back to the organisation uh, extraordinarily buoyed by what you had to say. So uh, I'm sure you'll all get, get, uh, gain a lot from David's presentation this morning. I'd also just like to mention that at the back of the room we have Troy from the Ergo Centre. So if you have any questions about sitting, uh, standing desks and uh, uh, a, a sort of a, a more healthy workplace, um, please go and um, speak to Troy in the break today. So if I can hand over to David and thank you all very much for coming this morning. Well, thank you, Imelda, for that wonderful introduction and thank you for the opportunity to come and present today. I, I love coming to this building. Um, uh, from the Baker, I'm green with envy with uh, the facilities that uh, you, you have here and um, it's, it's so great to see some familiar faces uh, that I haven't seen for a couple of years. So it's, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my presentation today um, is very broad um, topic of uh, physical activity and sedentary behaviour. I guess uh, the bulk of it would be um, directed at the sedentary behaviour because that's really the primary focus of our research program um, at the Baker. But uh, within the title you can see uh, chronic disease there and I, I guess I, I don't think I need to uh, elaborate in great detail to this audience um, who would acknowledge that we have this major health challenge um, in, in Australia of chronic disease and these are the selected chronic conditions from the AIHW where they've got some quick facts uh, on uh, an infographic uh, on their web, web page but um, you know it's um, amazing that there's a, a more than 11 million Australian adults who uh, have at least one of these uh, eight selected uh, chronic diseases and of course um, we have a focus at the, the Institute on Diabetes and also Cardiovascular Disease so we're, we're, we're right in the mix there in terms of understanding what impact such chronic diseases have on, on, on health. Um, my, my background um, was uh, from exercise uh, physiology um, and then moving through uh, more into physical activity, public health, etc. And I guess as a, um, uh, an undergraduate, uh, I, I, I was convinced that uh, uh, regular exercise was uh, so important for health. I mean, this is just one funny way, but um, I, I guess there's decades of evidence uh, highlighting why undertaking regular moderate to vigorous physical activity is just so important for health, in particular that improvement in that cardiorespiratory and muscular fitness, which we do know is a major determinant of um, uh, the development of chronic diseases. But I guess over the years um, I've been you know, looking at this from a, 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 from a population health lens and, uh, and, and become more and more disappointed um, by the, the, the low participation rates that exist within uh, moderate and vigorous physical exercise and um, at the population level sadly we, we, we have such a low proportion of the population that uh, are actually doing something that we know is very good for, for, for health. 
And I guess this encapsulates what, what's, what's happened. Um, and, and in over you know, a very short period of time, even over just the last two decades, we've seen dramatic shifts in our environment, which is highly conducive to inactivity, sedentary lifestyle. And this is just a funny you know, play on the uh, flat screen, etc. Um, another little cartoon I found the other day, which is um, one that resonates with me, because I do remember in the 70s where we got dragged in when it was dark. Um, but now you see more and more increasingly so this reliance on sedentary pursuits, particularly in our younger age groups, and you know, really alarming participation levels in, in physical activity in, in our younger groups. So we really have um, a changing world, and unfortunately a changing world for, for the worse uh, in terms of uh, sedentary lifestyles. What I'm going to do in just in the next uh, few minutes is to, to, to whiz through some fast facts um, to, to really set the scene. And, and um, I think this group would probably be well aware that uh, our physical activity levels are on the decline and um, have declined rapidly over the last uh, you know, two decades or so. You know, what's surprising here is uh, in around about uh, 19, oh, sorry, 2008 was when the US federal guidelines on physical activity were released. And uh, really, we have not seen, uh, it's actually gone the other way in terms of participation levels. Total physical activity has declined, but I guess if drawing your attention to this dark blue, this is the US, by the way, sorry, and it's US time use survey data. So um, re relying on people to report how they are spending their time through the 60s right through to the um, uh, forecasting to 2030. We don't have Australian data, sadly, that uh, I could replicate for this, but we'll use the US as an example here. So um, dramatic shifts in occupational physical activity, but I guess if you could focus um, on this black line, this black line is um, to average hours spent sedentary, and um, the caveat here is that that black line is only leisure time sedentary time, so it doesn't include occupational sedentary time. And what we're seeing is this you know, real shift towards a, um, a more sedentary lifestyle um, and a decrease in physical activity. So the bottom line there is that physical activity levels are on the decline and sedentary levels are um, su substantially increasing. The other fast fact is, um, and I alluded to this uh, a little bit earlier, is that uh, we really have not made great inroads in terms of getting the overall population more physically active. What this figure is showing you is the proportion of the Australian population who are aged over 18 or above from the eight, uh, late um, 80s right through to 2011 and 12. This is the proportion who are not meeting physical activity guidelines. So you can see it hov has hovered around about that 50, 60 per cent of Australian adults are not meeting our physical activity guidelines. And really, this has not changed over the past two decades. And now for someone that's you know, highly biased towards uh, engaging in regular physical act activity and acknowledging how much resources and effort has gone into trying to promote physical activity, sadly, we have not made huge inroads in terms of making the population more physically active. There's um, pretty well now known now that um, physical inactivity is a major con contributor to many of those chronic conditions uh, that uh, I highlighted uh, earlier. And it's estimated that physical inactivity itself actually costs the health budget approximately $1.5 billion uh, per year. <clears throat> so you could see that if we could get the population more physically active, we really it could have widespread implications for you know, economic Im implications, but of course personal Im implications in terms of reduction of these chronic uh, conditions. So I've set, set the scene there that we really don't have at the population level a highly active Australian adults. The other part of the issue that's really come to light over the last decade or so is Many researchers, including ourselves, have uh, gone back into their um, epidemiological evidence and, and started to look at what's the role of this too much sitting that uh, people are undertaking on a daily basis. What's the role in chronic disease there? 
And um, I guess uh, we're at the point now where meta-analyses have even been undertaken. This is one in 2015 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And, and it looked at that um, uh, relative to the, the low sitting, um, less than three hours per day, high sitters had a twofold increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and also a substantially increased risk of uh, premature um, death. Now, it's a lot of caveats in this, but uh, one, one of them is that this is based on self-report. So we can all um, appreciate how difficult it, uh, it can be for people to accurately record the time spent sitting on a daily basis. But still, it's indicating that uh, higher sitting is associated with an increased risk. The other part of the story is that for the majority of these studies that were included in this meta-analysis, most have adjusted or um, uh, accounted for leisure time physical activity. So it's already created an even playing field. So what it's showing is that, uh, that it appears that in addition to too little physical activity, high sitting itself is uh, associated with an increased risk of uh, chronic disease. But I guess that there's uh, probably one or two people sitting in the audience that would, would say, oh, but hang on a minute, I, I do my, my 30 minute brisk walk at lunchtime. Um, surely that's, that cancels out all the, that, the health hazards that you're talking to me about uh, in terms of sitting. Well, this was addressed just uh, last year in the Lancet um, uh, by a group of uh, researchers in a, in a Lancet physical activity series. Um, and it was a really interesting paper and it generated a lot of media attention. To walk you through it, it was a, a, a meta-analysis again where they pulled together nearly one million um, participants from international studies around the world with the outcome being premature death. What the question was, was how much physical activity is needed to cancel out or offset the hazards of too much sitting. And um, you can see by even the title that where the uh, researchers uh, were sort of leading this paper into, using terms like eliminates, et cetera, from uh, epidemiological um, evidence. So it's, uh, it's one that uh, created a lot of uh, contention and it led to um, some real conclusions from the authors uh, along these lines. And you know, this is just one headline, desk job risk eliminated by one hour of walking. But I want to focus on this then. If, if we look over here, that the, the reference here is you know, low sitting and uh, uh, engaging in uh, a lot of physical activity. What's quite clear is that other than this very high levels of physical activity, across all the other physical activity categories, there's a dose response for um, increasing amounts of sitting. So, what we're seeing is that even in 50 to 65 minutes a day, that uh, those that are sitting higher amounts have a higher risk. And of course, this is the, uh, the most dangerous group um, here. So it appears that it's only the very high volumes, 60 to 75 minutes per day, where we start to see some cancelling out of those uh, potential harmful effects of sitting. Now, just to, to refresh your, um, your memories, uh, this is uh, 60 to 75 minutes is nearly two times or getting towards three times the current recommended levels of 30 minutes per day. And remember I told you that we already have the population that only 40% of the population actually meets this minimum recommendation of 20 to 35 minutes. And you can see even in this category, even if you're ticking the box of the 30 minutes of physical activity per day, if you're sitting for higher amounts, you are at increased risk for premature mortality. So the takeaway from this is that it's really only very high volumes of modern vigorous physical activity that appears to be protective. And I guess uh, in recent years, we've started to um, get a little bit more sophisticated in our physical activity research and moving away from basing population levels on uh, self-reported uh, physical activity and, and sitting time. And um, within the OzDiab study in the last wave in 2011 and 12, we had a subsample of around about 740 adults over the age of 35 um, who 
who wore two devices, one on the hip, which is the accelerometer over here, which I'm pretty sure most would be familiar with this. This is um, actually um, recording the amount of physical activity, either a light physical activity, moderate physical activity or vigorous physical physical activity. And what we've done here is also use the active power, which is an inclinometer, which uh, can definitively uh, tell um, us how long a person's thigh, when it's fixed to the thigh, is um, in a vertical position or when it's in a horizontal position. So it can get a lot closer to understanding how much time spent sitting, standing, etc. And we've combined these measurements uh, and, and what we have on this side is uh, time spent sitting across a normalised 16-hour waking day and then this is time spent in physical activity of light intensity and of moderate intensity. Okay, so I think the, the key um, you know, striking figure here is that 9.2 hours of the average um, adult in, in this sample was essentially spent sitting. And if we delve even further down to that, if we look at separating or how much of that, those sitting hours were actually accumulated in bouts of 30 minutes or more, 4.2 hours. So that's what we would define as prolonged sitting, 30 minutes. So we're seeing a lot of prolonged sitting in the population. Not much <coughs> in terms of physical activity um, of moderate intensity. So that's the blue uh, marker there. And that's consistent with what I showed you earlier in terms of not a lot of moderate physical activity, vigorous physical activities undertaken on a daily basis. So I often get asked um, and by media and, um, and, and people in the audience so of, OK, well, tell us, what is it about sitting that's so bad bad for us. And I, I can honestly stand here and say, we don't know everything just yet. And that's, um, we're hotly pursuing that within experimental trials. But I guess if you, if you dumb it down to two defining features of sitting, what we do know is that there is a, a postural element, and then there's also the energy expenditure element. And if I go on to the energy expenditure element, what is a defining feature of sitting is that there is a substantially reduced muscle activity, particularly of those lower limbs, the legs. Okay? Um, and what that does is has you know, potential implications for glucose uptake, lipid metabolism, and overall metabolism. So remember I said 9.2 hours. Essentially, that's 9.2 hours of very low muscle, muscular activity. Then there's the other element, or the postural element, which has implications for um, circulation in terms of um, reduction in blood flow because when we sit, the uh, four legs of the chair are actually providing that gravitational resistance, whereas when we're upright and moving, we have that resistance provided by the body. We switch on a number of physiological processes. And I love to use this analogy of uh, the stagnant pond versus the steady stream. Um, whereby you know, prolonged sitting over hours and hours is akin to that stagnant pond situation in terms of blood flow, whereas if we're up and frequently making postural transitions throughout the day, we're actually getting that more steady stream approach in terms of blood flow, which is so important for you know, uh, glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism, etc. Um, what I've highlighted uh, uh, in earlier slides is uh, the problem of the volume of um, sitting time, um, whereby high sitting appears to be detrimental. Um, we've actually progressed this further in recent times by looking at uh, the patterns of accumulation in terms of sitting time. And we can do this using accelerometers and inclinometers. And um, this is Genevieve Healy's work back in 2008, where if you look across a full day, this is from morning down to night, for two people who have identical sedentary time, total sedentary time across that day, but there's a, a clear distinction of the breaking up of that sedentary time in this person, dark green here is the uh, prolonged sitting, versus the prolonger. And when we make the comparison between the breakers and the prolongers across the sample, we find that the people with, who break up their sedentary time more frequently have uh, lower waist circumference on average, BMI, triglycerides, etc. So it appears that it's not only a, a problem, an issue of the total volume, but how it is accumulated over time with breaking up being uh, likely to be beneficial. 
And we've taken this into recent reviews um, and using this analogy of the energy balance, you know, energy in, um, energy out um, balance, whereby we want to get people into positive um, energy balance. And we've used this term peripatetic, which actually comes from the Greek origin of peripatine, meaning to move around. It's just, it's simply the inverse of sedentary time or sitting time. And if we use the example of the Oz Dyer uh, data, what we do know is that currently um, there's uh, um, greater sitting time undertaken than active time. Um, I was pretty clear with uh, that uh, pie chart earlier. But what would it take to shift just to neutral, just to neutral peripatetic balance? It would take a shift of a reduction in sitting time by an hour and, of course, an uh, increase in active hours by an hour. But of course we want to go further and we want to get into positive balance. To do that at the population level, we would need to shift that two hour mark. Obviously it's just uh, transferred over into active um, behaviour. So this is a whole concept of uh, we need to make the shift in uh, reducing sitting time but increasing their physical activity on a daily basis. And it, it, it's not too dissimilar to this classic um, figure the dose response um, uh, that came out in, back in the 90s, which highlighted that, um, that in terms of public health benefits and individual benefits, the greatest benefit that we get is taking people who are doing nothing, this is the person A, to doing something. Okay? We don't get as much um, benefit if we're taking already active people and to try and get them to do more. Okay? It's, it's these ones here that we get the greatest bang for our buck in terms of activity. And I guess what I'm highlighting here, in this, back in, even back in the 90s, they were um, uh, advocating of the potential benefits of baseline activity, moving around. And remember in the 90s, people moved around a lot more than they do in current day. So I guess it's this concept that that sitting time or that sedentary time is, is actually displacing um, that opportunity to move more frequently throughout the day. And really, it's, it's in those that are not doing much physical activity that we're likely to get enormous health benefits. So I guess the, the message here from public health um, campaigns is that we could get additional benefit by just getting people to move more in addition to engaging in health-promoting exercise. And this is um, embodied uh, within our current National Physical Activity Guidelines, which were released in 2014. And you can see they've uh, used uh, um, public messaging of make him move, sit less, be active for life. So that's a real shift away from, you know, this uh, um, you must put uh, your, your runners on, you must, uh, you know, put your sweatbands on, etc. It's a more shift to getting people from doing nothing to doing something. And this is the current guidelines and the physical activity guidelines would be fairly familiar to uh, this audience. Um, uh, but what I want to highlight is that Australia um, with the UK, Finland, New Zealand um, are one of the few countries in the world that have explicit recommendations on sedentary behaviour. Um, and those recommendations are to minimise time spent in prolonged sitting break up long periods of sitting as often as possible. I guess what you can easily pick out from that is uh, we haven't got to a prescriptive type level for the sitting um, just yet, um, as opposed to physical activity where there's that 30 minute uh, type message. The reason is we just don't know what is, what is likely to be of benefit across the diverse population groups. So it's led us to start questioning, well, if, people, if, if, it's not, if you're not sitting, then what should people um, be doing? And this was a publication we had in European Heart Journal in 2015. Um, it's, it's a bit of a complicated slide, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. And what we're seeking to do is that if we allocate two hours of sitting to two hours of standing each day, or Two, uh, two hours of sitting to two hours of stepping each day. What are the likely benefits for cardiovascular um, risk markers? This is in the OzDiab sample. And don't worry about looking at all those figures because it's summarised here. Um, what we do see is that when we use this, this modelling of isotemporal substitution, substituting or reallocating sedentary time to active time, what we do see is that there are general benefits 
of that transition from sitting to standing for fasting glucose, HDL and triglycerides, etc. But there appear to be other benefits, more towards the adiposity benefits, of transitioning people from sitting to stepping, and that is benefits for BMI, waist circumference, etc. So it's giving us an indication that, yeah, you're gonna, there may be some benefits of standing, but you're going to get other benefits from getting people ambulatory throughout the day. So this has been a uh, almost 10 to 15 year program of research for us at the, uh, the uh, Baker to now start to address uh, the countermeasures to prolonged sitting. And um, how we've done that is to start to explore some solutions, potential solutions. So this is solution-based um, experimental research. And uh, here's an example of how we've addressed this by substituting that sitting with some standing, some uh, simple resistance activities and some light walking. And I'm going to just summarise uh, some of the key findings that we've had from these types of trials, which we would define as uh, interrupting sitting time physiology. It's essentially an experimental model where we want to un better understand when we expose people to periods of prolonged sitting, what uh, um, detrimental effects uh, occur on metabolic health, and conversely, if we um, interrupt or break up that sitting time on a frequent basis, what are the likely benefits in terms of its relative, uh, relativeness to that uh, uninterrupted sitting? And it's a, it's a fairly simple model where in, in a laboratory situation, we have people come in and they essentially sit for the, the whole day and we collect blood um, throughout the day. Um, and in the model, we use a crossover tri type trial. So the, uh, each person comes in and does each condition. And, the, and the, the breaking up model is just frequent, um, short bursts of physical activity of different uh, types of physical activity. Um, and this was the first paper that we had published back in 2012, where we took uh, overweight, um, uh, middle-aged um, individuals um, in a crossover design. And so each person did all three conditions with a, a washout uh, in between. And the um, exposure was a seven hour period in the laboratory. These people are um, remarkable in terms of being able to come in three times and do this. Um, but we had the three conditions of uninterrupted sitting versus sitting with light walking breaks. So um, two minute breaks every 20 minutes. We got them up off the chair onto the treadmill at a light pace, then they sat back down after two minutes. Then they did the same thing again um, uh, where that we actually just increase the speed of the treadmill towards moderate uh, walking. What we wanted to see is the um, impact of that breaking up on postprandial um, uh, responses to a high fat, high glucose um, challenged meal. And here's an indication we did not give them this. Um, we gave them a, a drink which you know, is approximately 75 grams of glucose, 50 grams of fat. And we want to see how well the body responds after that. In, in those three conditions. And this is the summary of the postprandial uh, glucose. And um, I, I, I direct you to this first one here. Now, um, we gave them the drink um, after sitting just for two hours, just steady state sitting. And here's the response for the remaining um, five hours. And, and it's quite clear that that uninterrupted sitting condition is where they fared worse in terms of the response to glucose. The introduction of the activity breaks led to an attenuation in postprandial glucose and summarised over here. And what's interesting is that the moderate um, yielded similar changes to the light um, in terms of uh, reduction. Why is this important? Well, we do know that um, postprandial rises, postprandial spikes um, frequently throughout the day predisposes blood vessels to uh, you know, a, a dangerous sit a situation on a you know, everyday basis that's likely to lead to you know, cardiovascular disease. So we want to dampen that glucose response as much as possible. Um, a more recent finding is um, uh, acknowledging a, a transition of our research program to a clinical population group who we suspect would derive probably uh, some of the greatest benefits of transitioning people from doing nothing to doing something and that's people with type 2 diabetes who already have disturbed glucose homeostasis. And the other part, and this is a PhD project of um, Dr. Paddy Dempsey now, he's uh, now passed, um, a PhD study 
where we, we were challenged in the previous uh, um, uh, uh, experimental trial that I showed you um, from people who are employers, etc., who are saying, well, how on earth are you going to get people up every 20 minutes in an office like this just to walk around for two minutes? That's going to be so disruptive, it's not feasible. So we had to look at types of breaks that could potentially be incorporated into a working day. Those types of breaks that are, are static. So we looked at simple resistance activities, and I'll come back to that. So this is a new study um, that we had, um, which was just further advancing our knowledge in terms of type of break, but also in a highly vulnerable population. <clears throat> um, within this study, again, the crossover um, trial model, <clears throat> we had the three conditions. One as I've shown you before. And then there's this uh, light walking break. So we wanted to compare the light walking to the simple resistance activity breaks. And what's different in this study is that we gave them real meals throughout the day. Okay, So we wanted to look at the post prandial response to a breakfast and a lunch. And they also wore their CGMS, uh, so a continuous blood glucose monitor, which we hadn't done in the past. So I've shown you what the walking was before. Now, the simple resistance activity breaks were a, a, a circuit of three minutes, whereby um, three different types of activities were undertaken, body half squats, and they just simply followed a video um, uh, and, and uh, then progressed to the next uh, exercise and then went through three cycles. Okay? So what we're trying to do there is engage these large muscles of the lower limbs. Here's a summary of the postprandial uh, responses. And in the top panel here is postprandial glucose. Red is the uninterrupted um, sitting, and then you've got the two meals here. In summary, the light walking and the simple resistance activity breaks compared to the prolonged sitting led to a nearly a 40% reduction in postprandial glucose um, of greater magnitude, um, not surprising, um, than what we had seen in the previous study. And uh, here you've got similar responses for um, insulin, C-peptide. And for the first time we actually saw that there was um, a, a lowering of the plasma triglycerides, but only in the simple resistance activity um, condition, which is uh, something that we'll need to pursue further. I guess the caveat here is that this is only one day, so no one's really done longer term trials. Um, just to quickly show you, we've looked at secondary outcomes such as blood pressure, and um, we, were, we were just startled by these findings. We actually sent the PhD student back three or four times to interrogate the data because we just could not um, believe that there would be such a, a dampening of the blood pressure response throughout that um, period. But it was verified by the norepinephrine results here where we see that those, just the introduction of those activity breaks led to a substantial lowering compared to that prolonged um, sitting. And finally, the CGM data produced another um, interesting finding for us. It verified what I just showed you in the laboratory situation, but then post-laboratory situation, we gave them a standard meal each time. What we did see is that that separation between the activity breaks and the prolonged sitting persisted into that nighttime period, which is likely to have huge implications for people with diabetes. Again, this is one day, whether it can be accumulated over time and whether you get an adaptation, um, that's yet to be uh, um, investigated. Um, another uh, study that has um, uh, just recently been published that uh, um, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, is a group from the Netherlands, which um, have actually started to look at um, across four days um, in terms of the breaking up. Um, they've actually taken 19 adults with type 2 diabetes, inactive uh, individuals. And this is an interesting model. Uh, I don't know how they got people to do this, but uh, they had um, people cross over to these uh, conditions. Um, of a, of a four-day type condition of 14 hours a day of sitting. Wow. Um, and then on a, a separate week, they replaced um, one hour or so a day of sitting with moderate and vigorous cycling. Now, it was accumulated across the day. And in another one, they had sit less. So they replaced 4.7 hours of sitting with either standing or light intensity uh, walking. Whoops. That's... Uh not a good thing. Okay. And this is just a, a quick summary of the findings, and it's you know, quite remarkable that 
Oh, clearly, the uninterrupted seating was not the, the best uh, condition. But what they did see is this is total 24-hour glucose, that the sit less, so the breaking up of that uh, sitting time uh, appeared to be more favourable, uh, slightly more favourable, <clears throat> it was significant compared to the uh, sitting group, than that exercise accumulation. But remember they were either sitting, uh, exercising and then sitting for long periods of time. So, um, and then again here in the hyperglycemia, you can see that it was the sit less that yielded the, the greatest change in terms of time spent in hyperglycemia. It's a really interesting findings, but again, it's over four days. We need to look at over months and weeks. But despite having um, an, an absence of intervention data over weeks, months, etc., we've now started to see leading health agencies like the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association starting to take notice and take on board that there, are like, or there could be potential benefits of um, uh, directing people to uh, sit less and move more. The, um, in particular, the American Diabetes Association, we were very fortunate we um, were included in, in the development of these. They actually put out recommendations around breaking up of sitting time and giving a 30-minute a uh, uh, sort of uh, definition of, uh, of uh, prolonged sitting. So, and again, level of evidence, C. So we still need to verify this in longer-term intervention trials. But we're also seeing you know, campaigns that, um, and, and you're all pretty familiar with the Heart Foundation's Move More, Sit Less, but campaigns from you know, the American Cancer um, Society, etc., and even Apple have incorporated this um, messaging of it's not only about getting that moderate and vigorous physical activity, but it's also about standing more and sitting less and also moving more. So they've incorporated, so we're already seeing it being incorporated in, into technology. And um, Huff Foundation back, way back, um, 2010, we're about to update these, um, we're actually one of the first organisations that um, put tips out there for consumers. And this is just a summary of the tips that um, could be incorporated in home work and also um, while travelling. And I'm led to believe it's one of the most frequently downloaded uh, materials in the physical activity space. Um, but just to finish off on, another part of our uh, research is to start to, to look at settings in which lots of sitting takes place. And office workplace is one in which uh, uh, a lot of sitting takes place. And we were commissioned by the Safe Work Australia to produce a, a report that summarises the evidence in terms of sedentary work. They've identified it as emerging occupational health and safety issue. And what we do know is that office workers do spend a lot of their days in the workday sitting, and a lot of it is accumulated in prolonged bouts. And this has been the focus of our Stand Up Australia program of research, looking into the benefits of reducing sitting time in the workplace. And our flagship study was an NHMRC study, the Stand Up Victoria study which is a cluster randomised trial, where we recruited work sites from the Commonwealth governments, or federal governments, um, uh, Department of Human Services across Melbourne. And we had 230 um, participants. It was a multi-component intervention where we um, you know, directed towards um, goal setting, individual behaviour change, etc. But we provided each individual with a workstation and also worked closely with the managers etc and to, to try and get that buy-in and support towards um, facilitating change and we had assessments at baseline and then after three months we basically um, ceased the uh, health coaching etc and left people to their own devices for the remaining nine months and the summary of the the findings and I direct you to the left hand side here and particularly the yellow highlighted ones this is the intervention group and this is the control group after three months. The control group did a great job for us, didn't change, but the intervention group, we nearly had, nearly had a two hour reduction in workplace sitting time, which was sustained, uh, albeit uh, slightly attenuated, at 12 months. And remember, we left after three months and so it was um, uh, it showed that it was sustained. But all of the change that appears went to, or uh, came via um, increased standing. We really were not successful in getting a lot of stepping or movement in the workplace, and therein lies our challenges for future interventions. And we've published just recently 
um, the blood markers from this study. And you're probably looking at this and saying, well, there's not much going on. But what we did see is that when we uh, look at, uh, out towards that 12-month mark, that cluster metabolic risk score, there was a lowering in the intervention group relative to controls, very small effect sizes though, albeit, um, but also a reduction in fasting blood glucose. Now remember, this was a group that didn't have diabetes, um, somewhere overweight, but it's a generally healthy um, group. But what it emphasises is that if you want to start to see changes from such interventions, you probably have to look at the 12 months or beyond to start to see um, these changes. Finally, as I mentioned, the sedentary, uh, uh, Safe Work Australia have identified sedentary work as an emerging health um, issue, and this is um, basically from their media release, highlighting that there's growing an evidence base, there's increased public awareness, widespread exposure, um, and so um, there's a need for growing advice um, from various authorities to suggest that it's time to address the growing hazard of occupational sitting. And I haven't even talked about some of those industries such as transportation, you know, manufacturing, etc., where there's likely to be huge amounts of sitting time. And um, uh, what we have embarked on with our colleagues at the University of Queensland is to work towards that translation of the research through a, a, a champion toolkit. This is essentially taking what we've learnt within the Stand Up Australia program and uh, up, um, developing a toolkit whereby champions in workplaces could pick this up and run the intervention on their own, in their own organisation. Um, and this is very close to being finalised for, for launching, um, but it, it's, it's, it's actually um, one in which we want to embed an evaluation component so that we can look at this over long periods of time in terms of the translation. And finally, um, uh, just to uh, um, point you towards uh, a recent development uh, that we had at Baker with uh, funding from the Vodafone Foundation. Um, this is two years of blood, sweat and tears of working with an app developer um, because I guess the gap that we have in terms of apps, wearables, etc., is most are skewed towards activity and getting people to engage in moderate, vigorous physical activity. Very few apps focus at the lower end in terms of the sitting, breaking up the sitting time. So we, we came up with the Rise and Recharge app, which can then be used either with the phone or with wearables. And it's a simple concept because uh, what we have is the day segmented into 30 minute uh, intervals. And as soon as 15 steps are detected by either the phone or actually the, um, the wearable, that uh, grey dot turns into a coloured dot. So the goal is to um, prov provide feedback for people on a daily basis. You don't want too many grey dots um, throughout uh, the, the day here. It's free too, so there's no commission to researchers like myself. Okay, so and it's on Android and also um, um, Apple. So if I can conclude with some take home messages, I hopefully I've conveyed that we've got this issue in the Australian public of too little exercise, but also excessive um, sitting. And there is now accumulating evidence, my kids have given me a cold, um, accumulating evidence linking excessive sitting to um, health risk. But I guess where we have the challenge, and that's where um, Australia is really leading the way, is that we need to identify solutions to overcome this normal. It's so normal for us to go into an office environment and just sit for long periods of time. And I haven't even talked about schools just yet, which is the workplace of our younger um, generation. Um, but I guess the key message is that this is all in addition to that message of promoting health engaging exercise, that people should minimise time spent in prolonged sitting and the, you know, sit less, move more, more often. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually do a lot of the work that I've just presented here. Um, the PhD students, I work closely with Neville Owen and my postdocs here, and of course uh, Genevieve Healy. And without the funding from uh, NHMSC, Vic Health and Har Foundation, we wouldn't have been able to present uh, the, this data. So I'll finish there and thank you for listening. Uh, the, the final thing that I should say is that within our physical activity conferences, what we've instituted is a standing ovation for the presenter at the end of the talk. Not only good for the presenter, but also maybe good for your health after 45 minutes of sitting. So thank you very much.
Thanks very much, David. I can see uh, David and I were talking in the car as I was driving him down here, and I was telling him that I stand for four hours or half of my day, and then I sit down. And I have to say, I don't do that every day. So I'm feeling after your talk that I need to do a bit more. So, uh, but you were saying it's a bit of a build-up uh, to sort of get used to standing all day or for longer periods at least. Yep, and I've used the example of the Stand Up Victoria in our office workers. We, we um, uh, gradually increased the amount of time that was spent standing. So I, I think a danger that we have for most people that purchase these desks is they go full on to yeah. start with yeah. and, and we really just burn out within weeks or, or months. So it was small steps along the way but gradually increasing over time to the point where they got to where it was a comfortable yeah. Um, activity. Yeah. And I love the idea of the app and the toolkit because it, it's it's all about translation, isn't it? It's one thing to hear about all the evidence, but then it's another thing to work out how we're going to apply that in the workplace. So that was a great talk. Thank you. Now, and I'd just like to open it for other questions. Have people got questions? Um, David, if I get up from my desk and walk to the shop and buy a cream bun yeah. and eat it, have I undone all the good I've done? Uh, well, yeah, um, and, and that's uh, one of the, the dangers um, because uh, these behaviours do interact with other unhealthy um, behaviours. And, and an example that we have, one of the tips is uh, during commercial breaks, take a break from the screen. But that's not to take a break, to go and get um, something um, from the fridge. Uh, and I guess <clears throat> what you're highlighting there is that a lot of this <clears throat> sedentary behaviour um, coexists with this postprandial state where we've got our body so challenged by the glucose and the fat that's being um, ingested. So I guess what we're you know, wanting to um, focus is a whole of day approach to this in terms of, and, and so no, I wouldn't be advocating going to get the green button. Robin? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask about, well, this year was my first year at learning TM, Transcendental Meditation, and so there must be sitting and sitting because you know, I learned that in Eastern culture you might sit in a cave for two years and that's good for you. So obviously sitting and eating the cream bun is worse than working. So what, have you explored, as you're learning more about sitting, what is the difference between the two types of sitting. Yeah, it's a really good point that you make and um, we're only just starting to tease this out. And there are some particular sedentary behaviours that are likely to be um, worse than, than others. And I'll give the example. TV viewing um, often is uh, um, uh, overlaid with advertising for unhealthy foods, um, snacking that's not uh, um, sort of a top of mind, etc. Um, so TV viewing is consistently shown to be the most detrimental. But there are some sedentary behaviours like reading um, that uh, re don't have such um, relationship. Um, so, it, we, I mean, we've got so much devil in the detail of, um, you know, um, unravelling what the likely influences are. But TV is one that's particularly um, one that is, uh, should be addressed. Um, up the back here. Hi David, Lucy Lewis from Flinders, how are you going? Um, that was a great presentation. My question revolves around um, a few of the studies that you were talking about that had the different conditions of prolonged sitting um, and then um, breaks of light activity and then the resistance exercises or more strenuous exercise. So this is, um, and I, you may or may not be able to answer it, but um, what do you think would be the difference between people sitting for 20 minutes to half an hour at their desk and then having a light, light physical activity or exercise break, which seem to be beneficial, do you think that that's better and then going back and sitting as opposed to having a sit-stand workstation where you'll be sitting for half an hour and then just standing statically? And I'm interested why you think none of the studies actually had that as a condition arm when that sort of seems to be what is being promoted in yeah, lots of workplaces. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah, question. Um, and I guess most of the breaking up studies um, have returned back to sitting. Um, and, I, and I think that that's to control for, you know, ultra, ultra control. But you raise a good point there, is that if, you, if you've been sitting for long periods, then stand, you know, get, move and then stand for the move, are you likely to get um, greater benefits? I think we don't know just yet. But what we do know is that from a glucose perspective, that um, the standing, um, instead of 
the ambulation, just to make that clear distinction. It appears that the standing, um, the, 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 the likely benefits are of a lower magnitude. And it's not surprising because you're not using as much uh, muscle, but there still is some benefit over prolonged sitting. But it's a great study design, and I think you know it's one that you know others will start to um, cotton onto. I think there's some questions from the girl in the maroon jumper. Yeah, Hi, Nadia Masterson from SA Health. I was interested to hear about your Champions Toolkit. Um, is that based in Queensland, did you say? Um, the, the people that are, are producing it are based in Queensland, Queensland. but it, it is a free and it's a national um, uh, so I was resource. In, yeah, I was interested to find out, you mentioned you're looking at doing the evaluation for that toolkit. What sort of measures are you looking at uh, using that's great. That? Um, you know, so we're using the REAIM framework as much as possible. Now, a lot is contingent on whether this can be successful at an NHMRC partnership uh, uh, grant level. but. Um, Without, even without the funding, we are embedding, um, you know, the, you know, re-aim, um, reach, etc., um, 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 framework into the evaluation. Now it's difficult because we can't go in there and put our devices on these people. So we're actually using self-reported um, measures to uh, identify what changes have occurred in in sitting. But you know, some of the other aspects of implementation, for instance, you know, what facilitate what what facilitates change, etc. Um, we haven't move to the evaluation part yet. Uh, Caroline Wilch from Country Health. I'm just wondering, do your findings in the workplace translate to people with chronic disease who are severely deconditioned? For example, heart failure people, if we just get them breaking up that sitting, will they get the same benefit? It's a good question and you've got people here in South Australia that are actually pursuing these um, these questions in, you know, for instance, cardiac rehabilitation. That's right, isn't it, Lucy? Yeah. Cardiac rehabilitation. Um, we haven't seen the evidence come, come through just yet, but I know that there are groups that are starting to pursue this and, you know, um, I've talked because we, we have a heavy bias on diabetes, being a Di diabetes institute, um, where we think that uh, a susceptible group is people with type 2 diabetes, but there's likely to be a number of other susceptible stroke survivors, etc., that um, could potentially benefit from this, lower, this paradigm shift. <laughs> Did you have a question over by the curtain there? Yeah. Yep. I was interested in the workplace one in Victoria. How much of that, the effectiveness of the maintained behaviour change, would, do you think was simply provision of the desks? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point, and um, a lot is probably the answer. Um, and uh, I, I think why we saw such change is that we, we had that intensive um, education um, program. And I think that this is one of the dangers that we have with this uh, um, huge interest in sit-stand workstations is that other than you know, people like Troy, um, <clears throat> often it's the manufacturer provides a desk and that's it. And, and there's really not that education um, support program that, it, that exists that we used within our study. So in terms of generalising, <clears throat> I think we have to be careful. And that's why we want to introduce toolkits um, like this to be able to raise that awareness that it's not just simply providing people with it. You have to actually give some um, education and um, support. And on the flip side, would the toolkit work? Yeah, that's a good point because the toolkit, um, yes, has a, um, a, a height adjustable desk component. But remembering in Stand Up Victoria, it wasn't just only about the desk. There were strategies within the workplace like um, conducting progress meetings where more standing was um, uh, supported, etc. So um, the toolkit has a host of strategies that what I would call no cost, you know, in terms of you know, walking meetings, etc. Now you can see we didn't get a lot of walking or stepping change, um, so we need to um, build that a little bit further. But I guess I, I'm, I'm trying to make the point that even within the Heart Foundation's consumer information sheets, it's not just about desks. I'm Johan Faragens, I'm a cardiologist, a researcher here at SEMRI. Um, I think we should have more meetings standing and that they last shorter and yep. they're healthy. Um, uh, one of the things, in the past I've organized um, a happy run, heart attack prevention program, and it involved a health check and a run towards the center of the city. 
And I remember organizing that, and my family came, and my friends, and um, there was this one big sweaty guy approaching me, and I was really happy to show him to the health check. Um, but what happened, he was one of the guys pointing the people towards the center in the streets. <laughs> one of the one of the uh, pointing guys. So the point is 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 um, you know you have a lot of guidelines and you show in your numbers that these numbers uh, remain steady and that's probably because you know for these healthy programs we have a lot of people who are aware here and 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 conscious of that they're not part of that group probably so how do you approach the the, the you know the the guys who point the people in the right direction in the street and uh, you know the the guys who are less aware. I couldn't agree with you anymore. Um, and I, I guess that, um, that the person that you're describing is not in that 40% who's meeting the recommendations. And I, I think that therein lies the huge challenge that we face in physical activity advocacy is how do we get those people to um, move from doing nothing to something? Because we know that there's enormous health gains um, likely from that. But we don't have a. Ma if I had a magic glance, I probably wouldn't be standing here. Um, but you, you do raise the, the probably the biggest challenge that we have. David Peter Salters from Summer really enjoyed that and the way you presented it. I'm going to ask a question steeped in nostalgia. When I was growing up in the 80s, the life being at commercials that would play when I was watching the cricket or the cartoons in the afternoon still ring very loudly in my ears. I can't think of a similar catchy commercial campaign of the last 20 years. And if there is one, what is the reach now that we have so many different avenues of uh, media and television other than just four or five free-to-air channels? How do you reach, as Johan suggested, the, the average person who's not motivated to wear an app? Yeah. I'd love to have a magical answer, but um, I, I guess in terms of public campaigns, there was the Eric campaign. What was the Swap It? Don't yeah, stop it. Swap it. Oh. Just small swaps. It's about small swaps. Small change, yeah. but that but went. Really, really didn't remember that right. Yeah, that that came and went very quickly. But I too do remember. Um, Norman was it was um, a, a really good campaign, um, and 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 it was more about you know getting up off the couch and, and moving more, and and people resonated with Norman because they. That was them. Um, I, I guess, um, I don't know whether you want to uh, say, but you're, you're working on, on the ground there in terms of how do we, how do we get those um, people to reach it. It is really hard because you go up and you give a presentation to people and you're saying, you know, daily recommended activity of 30 minutes per day. And we spend a lot of time trying to say to people, it doesn't mean go for a run. It means go to the post office or you know, go to the local shop or walk for 10 minutes or just do something small. And you try and sort of, because I think a lot of people think, I have to run. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Ville Mackinen from Samri Heart Health. I think it's all about financial rewards. That's probably the only way of getting people to do anything. Um, this is a bit of a sort of a, it's not really a feasible idea, but I always thought that uh, if you could force, um, let's say, food companies to spend half their ad money on their products and the other half for promoting healthy lifestyles, I think that could make a big impact. Probably not feasible. It probably isn't feasible. Um, I, I, I don't know whether it uh, you know, exists at the moment yet. No. Uh, it would be very hard to get the food industry to change Anything that tomorrow. Well. <laughs> what time's your plane? I'm just, there's some oh. more questions, but I'm right. just uh, cognizant yeah. that you've got to catch I know there's one here. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just wanting to comment on that last thing. I think um, I work for ICC Net Country um, Cardiac Tele Rehab Service. And, and I found that over the phone, if I use the word exercise, people shut down straight away. But if you change your terminology and say physical activity, they're more likely to continue engagement. And if you highlight that physical activity, like you said, is movement, then they're more likely to engage in it and be a bit more active. Yeah. I was just going to say, and even when we're in the nursing home, we went and did presentations in retirement villages, it was things like, why don't we just get up and turn the TV with our... Hand instead of with the remote controls, trying to adapt the messaging to the environment. 
Um, I think the other important aspect of, in which the Heart Foundation does a lot of work, Tuesday will speak more about this than me, is building healthy cities and livable places and active streetscapes and things like that actually helps enormously. Um, but just another anecdote, a friend of mine was cycling in the country last year on his um, cycle. He was 30 kilometres from home without a phone and actually had a heart attack and eventually got to La McEwen and, and all was well. But I, I said, well, that must have actually given some impetus for the people in the town to actually start getting active. And he said the opposite. He, they've all gone, no, don't ride, bi don't ride bikes. It's bad for you. <laughs> I think the solution, I was thinking of the solution because you, you don't have it, but I think Australia has given great solutions to the tobacco policy. I talked to Caroline Miller yesterday and she explained how well it works to tax things. And um, they're planning to do that with sugar as well. And I think in the UK they're doing that and that's probably going to be successful. And I think the sugar lobby will lose that battle. Um, uh, you can do, you can implement this also on this on rewarding people uh, a little bit parallel to my colleague just by maybe asking uh, insurance companies for uh, enforcing people to to move and deliver their data and then getting a reward in terms of a uh, lower fees of or something like that because eventually you will never you know it's really hard for everybody in this room also to stay healthy and you know everybody's struggling on some part of it Maybe I, I could give you one example, and um, I'm sure the Heart Foundation is familiar with this, is that Qantas um, has been working with one of the insurance companies where they provide um, uh, frequent flyer points for people that are achieving levels with the, you know, the wearable, uh, I think it's a Fitbit device, isn't it? Um, so, but you have to join the health insurance of, uh, the, I'm sure, yeah, Qantas and buy a Fitbit. So we're already starting to see some of this, but it's not at a large, um, you know, the scale that we need um, to change the population. Mm. Well, look, I think we'll wind it up. Um, I'd like to thank David once again. I think you've all had a fantastic talk and um, it's great to have made the opportunity to have you here today. I'd also like to thank Troy and the Ergo Centre again, and special thank you to Samri Heart Health for including the Heart Foundation here today. So. Have a good weekend and thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely need one. Thank you.